Thank you for joining us on Worldwide Slot Car Chat on Zoom number 99. Today we will decide how to enter the contests for uh, the magnetic racing kits that I found in my garage that I'm not going to put together. I'll let somebody else do that and enjoy it on their track. Uh, and I have another thing that I'll be doing. Uh, and then we'll actually draw names next week on the 100th episode to decide who wins those things. Uh, so we usually begin with show and tell. If you have a show and tell, raise your virtual hand and I'll make sure to get to you. I'm going to go ahead and start this week's show and tell myself. So let me make sure that I have my photo thing here. Okay. And share. There we go, share. All right, so this goes back to the project that I was working on for Kelly for his SCX Digital NASCAR collection that he's that he's wanting to use on his Skelectric Digital track. This is the first chassis that I did for the NASCAR, uh, SCX NASCAR Car of Tomorrow bodies. And I finally got my lazy butt around to doing the other chassis for the NASCAR Aero bodies, which is this one. Um, they are DPR, they are both Skelectric DPR digital plug ready compatible chassis, but this one doesn't have room for the for the big plastic hatch. So in order to get the DPR chip in it, you pretty much have to clip the clip the plastic door off of the chip and then stick the chip into the car. I designed a little spot for it and put a little hole for the LED. And I use some Gorilla double stick tape. Uh, let's see, tough and clear, holds up to 15 pounds. Anyways, it's it's clear double sided, uh, thick tape. So it's kind of like double stick foam tape, except it's not foam. It's like some kind of gelatinous stuff. <laughs> but anyways, I use several layers of that to help hold the chip up away from the chassis so that the LED doesn't poke too far out of the chassis and scrape on the track and to hold it to the chassis. Uh, and then got a DPR wiring loom from one of the analog guys who pulled it out of a Pioneer car and hooked it up. And that's pretty much all there is for that. Uh, any questions? <laughs> could you have taken or could you take a Carrera chip and replace that chip for that pretty easily? Is it, is yeah. It just to try yeah. 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 I mean, the Carrera chips are a little bit bigger than Skelectric. A, a, a standard Carrera brand Carrera digital chip is a little bit larger than the Skelectric DPR chip, but there are third-party Carrera digital chips that are smaller uh, and that would fit just fine. Or just a matter of changing them out. Just a matter of changing them out, and uh, the main difference is that Carrera has an offset LED, not a, not in line on the center center of the axis of the of the chassis. Right. You'd have to make another hole to the side where where it belongs for the Carrera LED. But otherwise, yeah, I mean, just like any slot car, you can install any any type of digital chip. For the most part, uh, SCX digital chips were, were pretty tricky to retrofit into other cars. Um, but most other digital systems are, are fairly simple to, to retrofit into pretty much any analog car. Uh, these chassis were designed specifically so that the entire motor pod and the front wheels can be pulled out of the SCX chassis and popped into this chassis. So he's not having to buy axles and wheels and motors and gears and all that stuff. Uh, those, what you see on this chassis is what came out of the SCX car. And I sent him back a bare chassis. The only thing you need to add that doesn't come out of the SCX car is the guide and, and braids. So standard slot it type guide and a couple of braids and your wiring and, and your chip and you're pretty much done. Uh, I was gonna say something else about that. Oh yeah, this one, uh, this is the uh, arrow body. This was a bit more difficult. Let's see if I have a better picture. Yeah, so if I zoom in here, uh, these wheels are on struts. So there is a there is a little clip that holds the top strut of the of the wheel that the of the uh, stub axle that the wheel is actually pressed onto. So obviously there's the wheel and then the stub axle is in there somewhere. There's a there's a strut on the top that goes up at an angle into this little clip here. And then there are struts on the back and front that go to the sides. So this took a bit more uh, work to design than just the clips. 
but I did have the work that I had done on the previous one that I could I could move over. And uh, to my credit, this pretty much worked right out of the first print just worked. I had I, I think the only changes I made were the I was I thought my screw posts were wrong, so I moved them, but they were right the first time. It was uh, modifications needed to be done to the body to make the printed chassis fit a little bit better. Um, but it pretty much worked straight off the bat, whereas <laughs> the previous one I had like four or five iterations before I got one that was fully functional. Greg, excuse the uh, rookie oh, question, yeah. but uh, what did you have this drawn out on a computer program? Is that how it starts or can you yep. scan it or? Yeah, so this, so basically this process started with the, with the Car of Tomorrow body uh, by, or the Car of Tomorrow chassis by me taking a picture of the chassis from, from up high, you know, straight down. So I was basically right. scanning the, the chassis with my camera uh, and then or with a ruler next to it. And then I could use that in my CAD program as a template for drawing the outline, uh, figuring out where the screw posts go. And then I would do extrusions and, and you know, do other things to add it. And I was constantly using my calipers with the actual chassis to measure things and make sure that they're in the right places and stuff. Um, but yeah, you, in order to print something, you have to have a model of it. And the reason I did this for Kelly as a thank you for him, uh, you know, using his account to host the chat for over a year was because nobody else was making this kind of chassis where you're taking the SCX parts and putting it into the chassis so you're not having to replace with everything with, you know, slotted or whatever parts. Uh, so I took it upon myself to, <laughs> to see if I could do it. And it turned out that I could. And the second time around, I got, I did it even better. Uh, well, it looks like it finished really well as well. Yeah, this one I printed with a matte black filament, which looks pretty cool. Instead of it's not shiny like the other one. But yeah, I did how's it handle on the track? Have you have it out? I have not put it on the track, um, so I'll let don't Kelly figure that one out. I don't. I didn't do any tuning. <laughs> I didn't 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 glue or true any tires or anything like that. I sent him back two fully functional and chipped chassis for the two cars that he sent me. Uh, to you know, to measure and use as as you know, testing. But so all the all the dimensions you took are the wheels still the same length apart, and the and the guide is still the same. So it should handle basically the same. It's got if it had yeah. the magic triangle, it would still have the. Triangle. Yeah, it, it should handle basically the same because it's a it's a it's an SCX pod, so it's yeah, it's got its own suspension using the little metal tabs. Those of course are not used for contact anymore. It's it's. Uh, soldered, you know, the wires are soldered straight to the contacts, not using those little feet. Um, he will probably want to put some tape across the bottom of the chassis crossing over the pod because some of the modifications to the body needed to make the uh, this new chassis fit better, give the pod a little bit more motion than you'd probably actually want it to have. But a piece of electrical tape or, or whatever tape you've got handy, you know, bottom of the chassis like tons of people do for their exotic cars will work just fine well if you sell them let me know i'd like to buy one so I, i'll you know, five bucks a pop just let me know how right. many, how many I'll you let you know. yeah i mean i put them on thingiverse so if you have a, a oh. printer then you can print them yourself i request that people print for their own use and not sell them because if somebody wants to buy them please come to me five bucks a pop Plus shipping. The SCX, uh, it, you said you made two different uh, design chassis. So are they universal? Those are the only two types of chassis that fit on all the SCX uh, cars? They are specific to the SCX NASCAR car of tomorrow okay. bodies, which are all the same, even though the liveries are different, the chassis are all the same. Okay. And the SCX NASCAR aero bodies Again, so all are, the cars are the same. You could so, not put this under a Corvette okay. or, a, or, <laughs> yes. or an Audi just or like, something like that. Just like uh, Carrera has uh, different chassis for every pretty much. Uh, just like Carrera, yeah. Skelectric, yeah, exactly. Ninko, Fly, <laughs> Monogram, all, pretty much all the other, every single, I don't know of any company that has a universal chassis 
Yeah. Other than Thunderslot, and I think that's probably only because they've only made a few models. Well, well, MRC did, but it was adjustable. No, I mean there are universal chassis out there, but how many of them actually included the universal chassis in all of their cars that were produced a fully a full car? Yeah. Um, I just wonder why you print, printed just uh, two different versions. So it was all NASCAR specific. Because uh, um, it's yeah, because one was pop and one was arrow. Yeah. Yeah, got it. Yep. So that's that's all that will fit. Uh, and I keep skipping to this, so I might as well talk about it. This is the Tire True, aka Area Three slash Professor Motor Tire True Truing Machine. Uh, this is Russ's machine. He wanted a reciprocator for it. But of course, my reciprocator only worked on the tire razor machine, so he let me borrow his tire true so that I could do a reciprocator for it. Uh, this one was designed from scratch with things that I've gotten better at doing, so it's actually quite a bit better in, in multiple ways than the original tire razor reciprocator. I'm probably going to revisit the tire razor version and make it more like this one, um, but there's no more plate. Uh, that goes back and forth across, you know, that holds onto the hitch and stuff. There's, there's only, uh, you know, it's a cantilevered gantry, so you can, so this can swing back and forth through here. There's a, there's a variety of improvements I've made on this, but the end of the story is, this has also been uploaded to Thingiverse. So if you have access to a printer, you can print your own reciprocator for the tire true from Area Three or Professor Motor. If you want one. Send me an email. I'll print one for you. Yeah, John. Greg, is that a gearbox on that motor there for the reciprocator? Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a geared motor. It's down to 30 RPM at at six volts, I think is what this one is. That's cool. So yeah, it has to go slow. Otherwise, it would just shake the plate off the, <laughs> off the machine. Uh, yeah, so I have all the specifics on the Thingiverse page, you know, about what kind of gear motor to buy, what kind of screws you need to hold the gear motor to it? What you know? What kind of screws I use for everything else? I designed this one to be as much printed stuff as possible. I did take some inspiration from uh, Kevin, who did an update for the tire razor version for the RSM tire chewing machine. He had some good ideas that he improved on for that machine, uh, and I took some of those improvements and, and included them here. One of the things that he did is he eliminated the, the plate that I had the arms connected to. This works great. It, the, the plate was never really needed. So I eliminated that as well. Uh, he used magnets to hold the, the hitch to the arm. Uh, I did that at first, uh, but I decided that the magnets that I had a bunch of in order to produce these for people if they wanted them didn't weren't really big enough to do a secure magnetic connection between the two. Plus, I didn't want the additional hardware concerns and hassle of putting in magnets during a print or designing it so that you could pop them in and, and other problems. So I went back to my ball and, and, you know, catch design, made it a little bit bigger. So it, it's that's fully printed ball hitch joint. Um, and I designed everything to not need supports during the printing process. So pretty much just put it on your printer and hit go. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Any questions button. on this? I get, oh, here's here's a funny story. So so I posted links to my Thingiverse for this, for this machine on a variety of Facebook groups and things like that. And said, you know, if you want, if, you know, print your own, if you want me to print one for you, you know, let me know and I'll print one for you. I get I get a bunch of people. Oh, that's great. That's awesome. You know, I, I need one of those. And three people ordered the tire razor version. <laughs> I'm, I'm expecting people to be like, oh, finally, now I can get one for the tire true. But no, the people who placed orders are like, no, I have a tire razor. I want that one. OK, it's all about advertising. You got to, you know, People don't know a thing exists until you put it in their face. I like that you shared that with somebody. They kind of improved it, and then you brought it back in house and improved it yourself. I that's what I love about three D printing. That's why I yeah, put my stuff the, out there. And the, and this just, is I basically say, open Greg, source. <laughs> Sorry, I have <clears> to <throat> say, Greg, I appreciate that machine. I have it right here. 
<laughs> and it is awesome. Did you did you true some tires with it yet? I have. Awesome. Any any problems? No. Smooth. It's just it was amazing, really. Good job, man. And and it's improved because of the other people who've who've worked on it. It's basically an open source design. Uh, Oxo Cube, I believe his name is Kevin as well. Uh, yep. The original designer for for the for, for the machine was actually designed for the tire true for Area Three tire true, and then I took everything that he did and, and changed it for the tire razor and made some made my own improvements. And then the other Kevin took it for the, the RSM and made his improvements. And then I took it back and made these improvements. And then I'm going to take these improvements and put them back on the tire razor version. And I'll probably make some, some more improvements as I do that one. So yeah, it's, I love this progression of, of development. Oh, yeah. Any other questions on this before I move on? So does the, the axle fits in across the, uh, the slots there? Is that how that works? Uh, so the, the gear motor rotates a little arm that you can't see because it's underneath. Right, right. Uh, and then that makes this arm, you know, go back and forth. Uh, you glue this little uh, ball to the end All of right. the sanding plate. And then the sanding plate is held in a channel on the, on the machine. So you can't really see the channel on the machine, but the sanding plate itself is in a very shallow channel. I got you. On the machine. Yeah, and that's that's true for all of the machines that I've seen. The RSM, the Tire Razor, and the and the Tire True here all have a channel so that you're not just sliding this the, the plate all over the place. Any other questions? Okay, moving on. These are the Magneto Racing model kits that I have. I have two spectator stands and one race stewards hut. And there they are, and they're all their multiple piece glory. So these are the things that people will be uh, entering into the contest for in the comments of this video. So if you guys come up with something fun that you want people to use as their content entry phrase or keyword or whatever, keep that in mind or write it down so you don't forget it. And we'll talk about that in a little while. Uh, since there are three model kits, there will be three winners. Uh, so when we draw names, it'll basically be a randomized list, and the top three will be the winners of, of the kits. Uh, I'm also going to do a contest for the Tire True Reciprocator, just like I did a contest for the Tire Razor Reciprocator. Uh, so if you have a Tire True from Professor Motor or Area 3 or whoever's making them at some point in the, in the past or future or whatever the case may be, if you have that machine, as shown in this picture here, then you can enter that contest. And I'll do it the same as I did last time for the tire razor. Send me a photograph of your tire true machine because you need to have it because you're not gonna get it if you don't already have it because they're hard to get. And I need to confirm that you in fact have the right machine because a lot of people confuse the tire razor and the tire true and they're not the same. Can't use this reciprocator on the tire razor or vice versa. So this contest is gonna be for the tire true reciprocator as you see in this photograph and to enter that contest you will send an email with the photo of your tire true to ggaub at ggaub.com just like always my first initial and last name ggaub at ggaub.com i'll repeat check. that later on in the video $100, what was that and a check for a hundred thousand dollars i'll take those as well Jeremy, do you have a tire true? I oh, you're muted. Looks like it. Oh, yeah, I got I got one of the old like first ones that were black and red. I think. Nice. Yeah. yeah. So you can print one out and confirm that your it works with that machine because as you can see, this one it doesn't have the anodized coloring, but I I'm assuming that all the dimensions are the same. Mine's even got the sticker still on it from Tire True. That's how I was like, I didn't know what brand it was for some reason. I thought it was like Area 51 or something. Area so 3 maybe. was the original, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to stop the share. And does anybody have any questions on any of those things before we move on to our next show and teller? Hearing and seeing none, we'll go to John. Mr. Kit, you are ready for show and tell. Take it away, John. Okay, cool. I, this is, um, I, again, 
I, some experimentation. I, it's too bad that uh, Dennis is in here because um, I, I was looking to make a chassis for the Chaparral 2G, and I thought, well, you, you guys are really good at using plastic bits and pieces. So I thought I, I looked in my bin to see what I had, and what I have uh, quite a few of actually are these TSRF motor pods, and uh, they come. I, I Falcon motors fit in quite nicely, and I think that would be a good motor for uh, for that type of car. So I got some. Um, aluminum uh, wheels. These are old BWA wide wheels. I cast some, believe it or not, those are SCX F1 tires that are just perfect. And I cast those in 40 shore urethane and kind of did the same for the fronts, although they're a lot narrower. And then this is sort of what I started with and what I was, the, the way this is designed there, there's three tabs that snap into a, a metal sort of pan. And unfortunately, um, the darn thing is so long, um, you can see the, pin, the, the pins there. Um, the, the car just is too short, so it won't work. So I thought, okay, I'll make my own side pans in some way, shape, or form. And of course, I'll have to shorten the center pan, if you will. Uh, the really cool thing, though, is that as a sidewinder, it, it actually fits even with those massive tires on the back because the car actually had huge, wide firestones on them. So you can see, and the motor fits in nicely, so I'll get a full interior. I, this this is, looks like a something to pursue. So that's kind of what I did. I'll uh, just show you the rear end. That's, that's, that's some serious rear end there. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's almost all tire. So it should be really kind of cool. And there's what it looks like upside down. So you can see the tires fit in the wheel <clears throat> wells. Uh, there's the center spine. And what it needs are some, some sort of outriggers that need to be fabricated in some way, shape or form. So I thought I would go to, uh, oh, but, sorry. I just, I had to see what the car would look like with Ford. Four wheels, I'm sorry, uh, for, forgive me. Let me just get through this. Okay, yeah, that's okay. Okay, that's some more rear engine. Here we go. So the first step was to shorten the pan. So I actually measured and cut. Um, and so this leading edge goes just right under the front part of the car. And luckily there are these wonderful little machined dots and they're, they're perfect for trying to decide where to put a guide blade. So, um, there you That's can a see digital it. saw, right? Sorry, say again? That's a digital saw, right? <laughs> a digital, yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. No, no analog stuff here. No, no. I, I, as I keep telling uh, my wife, my, my cars may be small, but my tools are big. Um, so, and then I cut a couple of just pieces of brass that I had kicking around. And again, did some really quick measurements and did, um, it's two and a half centimeters long by one centimeter. And that seemed to fit quite well. The trick, though, is to how, do you, how to make these slide. And I don't know if you can see a little bit of space under this support here on the motor pod. So I thought of sort of triangulating some sort of piano wire to try and make a bracket to float the side pans. And so here's the start of that sort of construction. Hmm. So then I just started bending. And it fits underneath and basically built a quick little triangle, and hopefully we'll solder those to the side. And that, then of course they'll have holes to mount to mounting brackets on the side. And then also to, to actually put a guide blade in, I took a TSRF guide, which comes actually with its own little brass, I guess shim for lack of, or, or sleeve for about lack of a, be, a better description, and then created the actual guide mounting area. And that's as far as I got it today, but I, I didn't know if, how well this will work or if Dennis had any pointers or if any of you folks have any pointers as how to you know, set up the triangle or whether that's is actually not gonna work or whether I'm just barking up the wrong tree. I think it's pretty clever, you know, using that, uh, t the, the plastic thing that you had there for the motor as the basis for the chassis. You know, and, and this is um, a glass um, in, reinforced nylon. That's what this oh. is. This is made up, by the way. Nice. So yeah, yeah. I, you know, I don't build chassis like that, but that certainly looks like it would do the job. Okay, cool. So the next step is to take it from from this to actually get it running. So that's no, it. I think I think the next step is buying a three D printer. <laughs> and okay, drawing only you have a lot of work and, and you can draw it and you can print it 
That's true. Yeah. Well, well only if Greg will put it together for me. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anything else, John? That's it. Thanks. Anybody else got any questions for John? All righty. Go ahead, Dewan. How much of that material do you have around? Or how many could, uh, of those uh, chassis could you produce? <laughs> okay, so if my wife's watching, uh, oh, a few, but since she's not, I, I think I've got about eight or 10 of them, like something really ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. So well, if, you put, if you put them in one container though, I think they, they actually find each other and replicate. So when, you're so when you're ordering the chaparral from John, be sure to put in your order for the chassis too. Yeah. Neil, did you say something? Yeah, I asked him if he casted that chassis or that motor pot. <laughs> no, no, I haven't. I, although, you know, that wouldn't be a bad idea. Hmm. The great thing about the nylon, um, so the glass and, uh, I guess, I don't know if it's glass infused or what type of nylon it is, is that it acts as its own bearing. So if you looked at the back, you can, you just put a, an axle right through those two holes and it, it's fantastic. You don't have to oil it. It's, it's brilliant. Hmm. John, if you cut it with a sharp knife, you might hear uh, a crunching sound as the blade passes through the nylon. And yep. if you do, it's more than likely you're cutting through glass fibers as you're doing it. That's yep. one way to tell whether or not you've got a glass filled nylon. If it crunches as you cut, as you cut, it, it, it does indeed. I, I noticed that when I was making that front uh, tab for the uh, guide guide blade. Yep, you're yeah, you're absolutely right. Interesting. Well, thank you, John. And yeah. next up is Leo. Go ahead, Mr. Torini. Turn whatever. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right. Back to the 3D printing world. Um, so on Slot Racer um, dot online, um, a chap there called John May. He's a 3D printer designer um, and has shared things with the community in the past, such as a control tower that I, I printed um, for your circuit. It's, it's a futuristic one, a central column, and it's an octagonal, hexagonal, hexagonal um, top uh, where, the, where the crew sits, sort of thing. So anyway, his latest offering, um, he popped up a, a, a post on the forum um, offering a track cleaner unit. Um, and I thought, oh, interesting. Um, so I um, got, I downloaded the file. Is, is the files there for anyone to pick up and um, print? I um, downloaded the file, managed to assemble it and have had some success with it. Um, it's not really a track cleaner. It's, it only cleans the rails really. Um, so that you can see here. So it's using what are kind of the, the polishing pads for a Dremel. Um, so you, you buy them and they look like uh, that, which is a 25 millimeter diameter fiber pad thing. Um, so I've, I've got three on this. In his original plan, it was just used two to cover the rails on the track. So it really just it's, it's a rail cleaner rather than a track surface cleaner. But for my purposes, that's that's fine. Um, so it has a motor which can you see it? Um, it has a motor which drives the axle with the cleaning pads on it, and it has a separate motor which drives the actual vehicle round the track. Um, so useful thing. Um, my particular interest, although obviously it's it's designed for clubs basically. Um, John designed it because he was helping his local club to move premises and so they, they assembled the track that they carried from the previous premises um, and he used to clean it. So rather than sort of working around, he designed this and they just set it off. He has the motor geared fairly to low speed um, uh, propulsion so it, it can run autonomously around the, the, the track um, and you just leave it doing its own thing for 20 laps or whatever, um, and it will polish up the rails. Um, so anyway, so um, for my situation, I have a track inside my house, which is quite small, and using this, this to clean it would be a bit mad. But some of you know that I also have a track in my garden, um, which is open to the elements. And the elements include passing seagulls and other sort of birds who tend to make a bit of a mess um, and, and spiders get all over the buildings and things, not so much, not so much the track, 
but spiders create a bit of a mess on it as well. So um, first thing was, rather than me going around and cleaning the bird mess off the rails, I can use this. And I've, I've actually had some success because obviously coming over, I don't use a track during the winter, but it has been quite warm the last few days. And so I thought I'll try this to clean the track and it worked fine. And I tried to video it, but sadly, <laughs> sadly, I didn't actually video it. I thought I was videoing, but I wasn't. Um, so I didn't video, I don't have the evidence. And of course it cleaned the, the, the poo off the track rails and I couldn't replicate it. So anyway, however it did work. Um, and I've put a video on YouTube, um, which I'll put a link to in the chat for people to see. And also put a link in there to the posting on Slot Racer um, for if anyone wants to pick up the file and print it. Um, I guess you could actually, you know, put in more pads and, and clean a wider surface uh, of, the, of the track itself. Um, but um, it's, 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 it's quite neat. It's 3D printed, as I say, and it's my, I printed it with a filament printer. Um, but it's pretty robust, says he, <laughs> twisting yeah. it. And, um, and did it, you put it, any it, solvent on the pads? I was going to say, did you put anything no, on the pads? No, no. The, the, the pads spin at high speed, so that they're effectively polishing the rail um, with the pad. But yes, I could put I could put something on it. So that, that's something I hadn't thought about. Um, I, and I could put something on it. Are you using it on stainless steel or is it a braid? It, it's Carrera stainless steel oh, um, rails. So the, the, they're pretty durable rails. It's outside in the garden 24-7. Um, so it gets rain, snow, and all sorts of things on it. Um, so, yes, so these are not going to harm it, I don't think. Leo, if you ever wanted to put a body on it, you should think about a Chaparral 2J. It was a vacuum cleaner as well. Yeah, good point, yes, yes. Or a Zamboni or <laughs> a street yeah, well, sweeper. <laughs> there, there was a chap called Kelvin Light who produced basically a Zamboni for slot cars, didn't he? Um, I'm not sure where he was based, whether he was in the USA or, or Canada even. Um, but I'd be um, surprised if that was American. He's got to be a Canadian. Who the heck else know what a, knows what a Zamboni is for crying out loud? Yeah, <laughs> good point. Yeah, good point, yes. Um, but I don't know, but he stopped making them pretty quickly after he, he produced them. I'm not sure what size they were either. I think they might have been HO scale. Does anyone know? No. No. You might need to print a snowplow body for it, Leo. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I, yeah, think I, know my next, I think I know what my next project might be. That's a great idea for a track cleaner. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you put Ooh. your advertising on the side. Awesome. Yeah. 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 I downloaded the files, but I haven't I haven't printed it yet. I'm, I don't have an outdoor track, so I, I don't really have right. a good reason to do it. But yeah. <laughs> so, uh, does John has your... updated the, John's updated the file. The, the brackets holding the um, the polishing motor, uh, the bracket that holds this motor in, wasn't part of the file, so I had to I had to you know jury rig a, a piece of plastic to hold it in place. But he's now fixed the, that in the file. So if you downloaded the file fairly quickly after he published it, then download it again and you get the the better file. You, you may but have printed, created a whole printed, new class no of racing where you know not only do you have to win the race, but you have to do the most cleaning. Whoa. <laughs> it'll be like it'll be like curling. So, yeah, yes. exactly. Yes. Yeah, that's right. A cleaner yep. right in front yep. of your car. So when you come so, home now and tell the wife, you know, you cleaned yep. up tonight, it has a whole different meaning. Oh my yep. gosh, Leo, you just you just invented the first real Scottish slot car racing series. That's amazing. Um yeah, I'll 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 print so the chassis your, in granite. A granite does chassis. Your pad does your pad and your tires are they opposing directions? Ah, good question. Good question, Russ. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I first thought that I would counter rotate the, the drum, the pads, mm -hmm. so they would they would rotate in the opposite direction to the forward motion of the vehicle. Right. But it had problems going around sharp sharp corners, so like R one inside lane corners, it just it, it, it we were fighting against each other, and it was it just didn't like it. So at the moment, it's it's running um, in the same direction as the traction wheels. Can't, okay. You can't see that, but they're both they're both going in the same direction. But I okay. think yeah, running it in the opposite direction makes more sense. I think, um, and I'll probably try that on my outdoor track uh, and see how it performs there. But as you can see, I've yet you know, I have used it, and, and the pads are a bit you know manky as we say in Scotland now. Um, as a result. 
Um, the pads are not very are not very round, so they do tend to sort of touch in some places and, and not in others. So the pads are marked. Um, I don't know if you can see. You know, the, the pads are not consistently marked all the way around. Be the uh, pad truer. <laughs> yes, exactly. I need to print out a uh, reciprocating track tour, a tire <laughs> does, does that chassis have a magnet in it? Are you able to adjust ah. how strong it holds down? Yes. Okay. Um, that was part of John's design. Um, I've put two electric um. magnets in here to hold the guide down, basically, to give it good, not so much to track this. There's quite a weight in it. So the weight of the chassis and the, the paraphernalia um, keeps the traction tires um, with a fairly good grip, but um, yeah, the, the magnets hold the, um, the the guide in place. You know, uh, Travis with that slot car guy, I know he's got a magpie that goes into his building all the time. I, if uh, I'll try to try to let him know, but if not, when you see him uh, mention your mention that device, he'd probably find it quite in, quite useful. <laughs> I know, <laughs> I know, he's complained about it. And his track is right. so huge. I'm sure he'd like a machine to do the cleaning instead of him. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. Magpie by now. I well, would be interested to know if you could design that to do the full width of the yeah. car. car yes, I mean, the width of this, I think, was designed for a sort of 132nd scale um, uh, track. Mm -hmm. And the rear axle I'm using is actually a um, a Ford Focus axle with Formula One wheels and tires. So that gives you an idea of how wide it is. It's, it's, it's wider than a normal Skeletric car, but um, I'm sure it would cover the full width. And if you if you post on slotracer.com, uh, sorry, slot, slotracer.online, uh, then John might make a, a full width cleaner. Well, when you look at that design, it looks almost as though you could use even a wider than a car body in there. Yeah. And then yes. to drive it, use something similar to the Razor, where it's driven by the center of the axle. Yes. On yeah. the side. Yep. And then if you had, I'd, I'd be willing to get one. Even if you if you had one that was um, just make a one twenty four scale three and a half four it basically. It just make it one twenty four scale. That should cover the one thirty two. Good. Yeah. Yes. Work from Carrera. Probably what you want to do is is Leo's going to put the link to the thread at at slotracer.online yeah. in the chat. Probably want to go to the chat and and post uh, or go to that link. Sorry, on slotracer.online. And post a message saying, "Hey, I'd really like a you know a full width cleaner version if if you're up yeah. to doing that." And I'm sure you probably would. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when you build your uh, snowplow body for it, there you go. Just put a cleaning thing right the way across the front of the plow. Yeah. Yes. Some people do that with something they call swiffle swiffer pad or something. No. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I, I don't think they're, they're sold in the UK, so I've never actually seen one. But yes, this is a, basically a blade with a with a duster, a bit of a duster on the, on on it. Mm. I have um, so, yeah. I have that. Yeah. I have a track probe. I don't know if you guys have seen those. You push them with a slot car. Yeah, I think that's what Leo's talking about. Yeah. yeah. And has a on it. And the good part about them is you don't need a great deal of tension on it because once it's gone around once, it just continues as each time it goes around, it just cleans more and more. Yeah. As, as yeah. Leo said, you just let it go and just do 20, 30 laps, whatever. An autonomous vehicle. Yeah. <laughs> They're all awesome. the rage. <laughs> good stuff. Thanks for sharing that, Leo. And don't forget to put, the, put those links in the chat for me. Yep. Uh, next up is Jeremy. What you got to show and tell today, Jeremy? All right, um, I'm going to use my camera. This, excuse the mess. Um, are you guys able to see this area here? Yep. So this is my, I was working on a scale. Let me boot this up. I'm, uh, it's just so I can show you. I finally got it working. I got all four of my scales ordered and working. So I'm going to boot this up and are you able to see the scale? Yep. So I can zero it out here with this button. 
there. And then with my load sensor, it's telling me which side has more left, right, total weight. So if I want to add more weight to the left side, then it tells you you've added to that side. Uh, try not to do this more to this side and it comes back. Now I've only got two scales hooked up right now, but I do have all four working. And now I'm just working on creating the, the bait in the enclosure for it. So the load sensors do work. They're very ridiculously accurate, like 37.1 grams. It's telling me like on my old scale, I was lucky to get within one or two grams of what it was doing. So oh, that's it is fun. working. It'll work left since I only have two scales on here right now, but you can kind of see it'll tell you front and back. Well, this would be, I can't see this would be front and back. So if I wanted to add more weight to the front, now it's up to 71 grams on the front. That's great. There. So I'll be able to do all four corners with the, the weight and, and get it working. Now my prototype is working. I just got to get the case built. So awesome that's all. job. That's yeah, awesome. Thanks. Yeah, that's cool. That uh, is really sure. cool. Really I've cool. been trying to find grand scales that I could fit four together, you know, so that you can do each corner. And that's basically what he's doing, <laughs> except yeah. that's what I'm doing. better with a better interface and stuff. It's taking Perfect. a little while. And the hard part is like, I, I don't have, uh, Greg makes much better products than I do. I'm bad at CAD. So it's just, it's gonna, that part's going to take me a while to get these all working and, and looking right. Well, I'm happy to help if there's anything I can do. Anything. Will it be in the stores by Christmas? No, oh. <laughs> no, no. I think I think the best thing I can do is just kind of open it up and let people build their own. Yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to go because I don't want to be tech support. That's that's, <laughs> that's the biggest pain. Uh, and it looks like it's not going to be. Uh, you know, there was a lot of wires there, and I understand. Yeah. You know, that <laughs> I'm sure you'll be able to provide a fantastic guide on how to do it. Yeah, but but there, there's really only like. Uh, I think on my main board, there's probably only 10 wires that go into it, but you have to run a wire to each load sensors chip. And then that load sensor chip has four wires going to each load sensor itself. So it's like, it, and I got to figure out how to run that all through. And so it doesn't bind anything. And so now but Jeremy, so what are the load the sensors? What are they? Yeah. Um, they're digital load sensors. They're used in manufacturing. I think Bill talked about them. He uses them in his shop, but they, uh, the metal is a, let me see if I, I got one right here. Yeah, so the metal is here and there are four points of contact and there's four wires. And as the metal bends uh, with weight, it senses the difference in, in the metal, it, it, like how much voltage goes through the wire mm -hmm. ohms, actually ohms or something. Okay. And it tells them the, I mean, these are actually used for scientific method or purposes, but I, I didn't realize how accurate they were. I mean, they're insanely, like even if i plug it into a different power source sometimes i'll get little weird fluctuations on mine because any kind of fluctuation will give me like a one instead of it'll give me like a 0.1 fluctuation instead of saying 1.0 grams it'll be like 1.1 1.2 mm -hmm. but i don't know so far okay. it's it's working okay i mean i uh, i have noticed just playing around with my stuff and putting it in the center i've noticed like the side that has the crown gear on it you know is now a gram and a half or two grams more than the other side. And I was like, I never, never really thought about that, but I guess I should have, instead of putting weight right on both sides evenly, I probably should have shaved a little off on one side that had the crown gear. Now I can figure this stuff out. So, I mean, I, it's not gonna be perfect, but it's gonna be good enough for my racing trigger finger. Well, now, now depending nice. on the track you're, you're driving, you can also weight jack too. Could do what? Yeah. Weight, uh, weight jack. Yeah, so if you have is. more left turns than right turns, you can, oh. right? So, for example, if when racing. real cars drive at Monza, they wait jack for a right-hand turn because the last turn before the start-finish straight, which is uh, parabolica, is what everybody sort of sets their car up to uh, overtake other cars for. Well, I just like the, to be able to live move weight around and get an idea of where it's going. That's That's been one of my biggest problems is trying to figure out, you know, 50-50 weight, 60-40 weight. I don't know. Everybody's got their own opinion. But... I just can't, I can look at some of the cars that I have that run well and go, okay, here's what, here's maybe why. Maybe it's 50 50, maybe it's 60 40. I don't know. But I'll, I'll have it done hopefully by summer. But... Another load sensor is an inexpensive item, or are they? Uh... Uh, I got four of them for, I think, four bucks. So, oh, really but low. that's, but oh, yeah, I, 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 
I think the entire project building it was maybe 26 bucks so far, but that's without time and labor and then 3D printing, like just for the parts I have here, like the most expensive was that little 2.8 inch screen. That was like 12 bucks, I think. That was the biggest problem. And this but, is pretty much through um, AliExpress. AliExpress. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can't go to Best Buy to get these parts. No. <laughs> so. If you can ensure that that, that uh, surface is level, uh, you know, whatever surface you're working off of is yeah. level. Anything you strap above it is just going to work that much better. And if one of them's off, it gives you a warning before that machine on top starts tearing itself apart. It's just load cells are a great, great method. Yeah, I, so I, I'm really interested to see how this how this project goes. So cool. Once I once I get the, they have mounts, so I can mount yeah. it. Once I get it mounted, and I'm, I'm going to print all of the mounts an even size, but. Uh, they have screws, threaded screws in here, so I can Thanks screw them all down. And then in my, I don't know, I didn't show that. Oh, that was that wasn't me. Uh, but once once I go into the software, I take what I did to do this was I took a a nine volt battery weighs exactly forty five grams as my test weight. I tested it, and then in the software, I was able to adjust, you know, up and down to get it to zero. And so that way, all four scales are zeroed. And I, I don't know if there's going to be any differences on load cells, how they operate at higher altitudes. I don't know if that's going to make any difference. I, I mean, there's all kinds of weird things like how metal reacts in cold. I don't know. I, I'll find it out, I guess, as we go. But so far, so good. All right. Really I talked too much. Cool. <laughs> that is super cool. And thanks for sharing your progress on that. And we look forward to more progress in the future. Uh, does anybody have any questions before we move on? Seeing and hearing none, let's move on to Bill. Go ahead, Bill. What's up? This is a, a quick question. I'm looking to find out, does anyone here have a laser cutter? I'm looking at getting a laser cutter sometime in the next month or two, and I'm starting to do the research about it. Got one right I'm here. just sitting there, I'm looking at all these magnetic racer ones and all these things, and I'm like, you know, I'm, I could just teach myself this stuff. Right, right there, yeah, the Mark's thing is a K40 laser. Have you had good luck with that? Because that's that's yeah. basically it's been the X Tools D1 or or that one that I've been looking at. Well, if you like to build and tinker, you know, and it, it with it, it, you just can't jump in and go, hey, cut cut away. You know, you have to remove the build plate, make your own build plate for it. But yeah, it's been really good for I mean, four hundred bucks. I mean, or whatever, five hundred bucks, I think. And so, where you able in terms of the build surface, is it is it enough space? Have you found that it's done everything pretty much you wanted to do? For me, I, I haven't really gone above twelve inches by I think twelve by ten maybe. Okay, but I mean, if it, it just depends on what you're doing. But my 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 dream was just to build stuff. But that that one guy makes the the one Greg's giving away the scenery stuff. I originally wanted to do that, but I just haven't had time to do anything. But I was just doing small stuff like that. Yeah, and that's that's basically I'm just uh, with the existing layout. You know, that's cool. I'll, I'll probably I asked uh, one of the guys that does some of this stuff uh, to quote me on it and. And it may, it was a good quote. It, it's a great quote overall for something I was asking to get done. But then I'm sitting there saying, I could do this four times. I, I have a printer in front of me, you know, if not, if not less. And so it just makes sense. And it's kind of in nature with kind of, or, you know, kind of like what I, all the rest of the stuff we do here. 3D well, do printing, you have a 3D printer? Building. I already have my 3D printer. What, do you, what model do you have or who, what brand? Uh, Prusa MK3S. Okay. So if you went with the Prusa, you wanted support and be able to, you were a little worried i don't think i would go with the k40 then because the k40 you got to get all the help on your own you might want to go with what's that one the glow forge i think you might want to look at that <laughs> oh no, oh, no. too that's much crazy. okay yeah that's co2 i could i okay. could do diode i'm a diode man all right yeah. all right well I've, yeah the k40 you know it's not that i can't do it it's just that i frankly i look at the i look at 3d printing and i look at at the laser cutting and kind of the the learning curve and it just 3D printing looks completely horrifying compared from what I from what I'm looking at. On the other hand, anytime you start something, you're like, oh yeah, that looks totally easy. So we'll see. Yeah. All right, well, cool. I'll I'll uh, I'll do more research into that. But yeah, definitely. Or if you find a file you want cut, just shoot me a message like in slot form, and oh, I can yeah. cut it and take a look at it and see, see if that's the quality you need. You've been, Sorry, you've been getting messages all day long, but oh, no. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. The uh, yeah, we'll figure it out. But yeah, cool. Thank you. Appreciate it, Jeremy. All right. Thank you, Bill. And it looks like we are done with show and tell. Does anybody else have any show and tell they want to do? Mr. Miller, would you like to do a show and tell or just introduce yourself? I don't think you've been on before, have you? 
Oh, I've been on before. I'm Chappie okay. Man I recognize 66. your voice now. <laughs> yeah, everybody knows me as Chappie Man sixty six. Hey. So this, hopefully, you can see. is the Toyota 7 3D printed body. You guys are driving me nuts. <laughs> so I had to show off some of the work. This is uh, FDM printed off the ender. Nice. And then this is the last one that uh, Vlad did. This is the Ninco CLR. Wow. You said that was FDM printed? Yep. This is all the so smooth? Ender. Did, what'd you do to get it so smooth? I cheat. Okay. <laughs> he's he's doing some remarkable stuff. I I yeah, I haven't even tried to get that kind this of This is this is the Lola T seventy. What orientation did you print that in? This is printed flat on the plate. Really? Nice. Yep. So this is a uh custom chaparral 2d that i did took the rear end out of it to make the uh, original daytona moment uh, version don't show that to juan <laughs> so um all of that is done with uh creality ender those are not resin printed and the there's a few secrets to it um Steve Henderson and I are, have I figured it out, uh, but it's really all about layer height. The 0 0.06 layer height and slow printing and your slicer settings allow you to do that. It's it's not that difficult to do, and there are a lot of good body files out there. These tend to weigh in somewhere between uh, 10 and 15 grams by the time you're all up. So. I mean, things have improved in that field since we've been doing the chat. <laughs> oh, tremendously. I mean, two years ago, we started doing this and it was crazy. And, uh, you know, now I don't feel afraid of doing something like that at all. So anyway, very, very capable technology now. And Mr. Kit, if you want a 3D printed chassis, that's crazy easy to do. Okay, no, thank you. Well, it looks like you, with those bodies that you're making, I'm out of business, man. <laughs> well, I haven't done a 2G yet, That's that, but that is on the list someday, yeah. <laughs> I want to have both versions. Got to have the narrow fender and the wide fender version. Okay. Now, those look, those look awesome, Paul. My goodness, they're wonderful. Yeah, I'm sure they look even better in person. I think you're still ahead, John. <laughs> well, it, yeah, that, it, yeah that's, that's an interesting statement and it's a matter of opinion. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much for sharing, Paul. Uh, does anybody else have anything they wanna share before we change topics? I just wanna ask Paul, uh, what slice of program are you using? Probably Cura. Uh, yeah, I have to un unmute myself again. That's all done in Cura, yeah, but I run Cura. Cura I, I run an old version of Cura. I yeah. used 3.6 yeah. because I found that when I updated to some of the version four um, updates, I had some really interesting experiences in the, <laughs> and the printing just didn't come out well. So I've stayed at 3.6 and that's been really stable. Okay. Good. Thank you. One of the one of the nice features I'm not sure if Cura has this because I don't use Cura, um, but one of the cool features in Prusa Slicer, which is an offshoot of uh, Slick 3R or Slicer, and then Super Slicer and whatnot, that's whole open source thing, um, is variable layer height, and and so not only can you set a very fine layer, just like you're talking about 0.06 or 0.05 or whatever, you can have the have the slicer automatically determine the optimum layer heights throughout the model from start to finish based on the geometry of the model so if it's basically just a vertical wall it doesn't need thin layers because you know it's just a vertical wall you're not losing a lot of definition but when it starts to do those curvatures or 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 you know 
uh, slopes, uh, very slight slopes or curves like domes and hoods and, and roofs and things like that, then it progressively makes thinner and thinner layer heights automatically. And you can see it in the, in the results. When you slice the file, you can zoom in and look, oh, well, there's the, you can see the layers get thinner and thinner. And so throughout the model, you've got thick layers and thin layers and thick layers and thin layers. And it's done primarily to speed up the whole print. Because if we print it from bottom to right. top at 0.05, it takes you know two or three times as long. But if you let it do thick layers where it's OK to do thick layers, you're, you cut a whole bunch of time out of the process. That is true. Cura, it doesn't quite have that automated. You can do it through the G-code settings and tell it to run a certain layer height right up until layer 20 or something like that and then change it. The challenging thing with the bodies is that most of them are so curved in the various directions that there really aren't a lot of good places to do thick layer heights. So you really end up with a situation where the thin layers are best for pretty much the entire model. Yeah. And it, it does take some time. It takes, you know, 15 or 20 hours to print a car, but you know, on the other hand, you get a body you can't get otherwise. So, and it, and that's what nights are for. <laughs> well, started, that's that's exactly in... it, right? You, I feel you like start, every you start the printer, and then you know the next morning you get up, and there's a body there. I feel oh. like every print is is twenty hours. It doesn't matter what it is; it's going to be twenty hours. <laughs> John, Greg, what what's that, that feature called? Time. John Kit, how how long does your molding take versus that twenty hours? Oh, I, I pull a body out every 20 minutes. Yeah, but that's not counting all the, all the stuff. Yes, that but you, but do, you do hours of preparation to do that, John. I used to cast bodies too. Yep, yep, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're, you're going to lose one way or the other. You're on the front end or the, or the rear end. You know, it's right. Just like I mean, if, if, if you take the file and plug it into the slicer, that's seconds, right? Right. But then you got a 20 hour print. Otherwise, you take, you know, 20 hours to make your your mold or a couple of days to make your mold by the right. time you do a two part mold. And then, you know, you pop a body every 20 minutes. So pick your poison. Yeah, exactly. Either way, we're paying taxes. <laughs> if you're using Cura, if you go into experimental features and look for adaptive layers, that's where you can set like Greg was talking about 0.3 versus 0.8, you know. Yeah, okay, there you go. Yeah. Adaptive Perfect. layers. Thank you. There's so the 350, in, yep. So so Bill was asking what that feature is called. So this is Prusa Slicer. Um, and and like you guys were talking with Cura, you can you can do, um, uh, where, what's it called? I don't use it very much anymore. Um, Height layer basically you can you can say you know print different layer heights you know and tell it where to start certain layer heights and where to stop certain layer heights. Um, but the feature i'm talking about is is shown by this icon right here it's called variable layer height and you can manually do it by using your mouse to to, to make it less or more you know thicker or thinner layers. Um, but if you use this dialogue down here i'll just reset. This is probably this is that Elva, uh, the uh, Elva, or no, this is the Ferrari. <laughs> this is probably going to end up with mostly thin layers. Let's let's click the adaptive button and boom, yeah, there you go. <laughs> so the whole thing is pretty much all you know, 0 0.07, 0 0.06, 0 0.05, 0 0.04, you know, layer heights from the bottom to the top. Uh, That's a great but, tip. Thank you. But then you go slice it, and then this will probably take a minute or two. And we can zoom in and look at the actually see even with those thin layer heights you'll still see some stair stepping on on those mostly flat areas. Uh, but if we zoom way in. Well, wow, can't even see those layers. There we go. So th so these yellow lines represent the the width of the nozzle basically a 0.04 millimeter nozzle. So you can see how thin those layers are, you know, point, <laughs> 0 0.04, 0 0.05 millimeter layers, super, super thin. But yeah, I, I don't even do the manual editing anymore. I just go adaptive, I, I click variable layer height, I click adaptive, and then I, I just go with it. I forgot, you, you could also change nozzle, um, like to a 0.2, 0.4, yeah. if, if you're willing to put the time in. 
And then the other thing is that if you go look at other groups that do uh, miniature war games, uh, they do a lot of tinkering on this to get FDM printers to print, you know, like little knights that look, you know, not so choppy. Yep. I forgot. I almost I forgot all about that. I should go to take a look at that. Yeah, I remember one of the tricks they used uh, when I first got my printer. Of course, I I wanted to try that and see what figurines would look like, and the the tips that I saw back then were uh, to to fool the printer into doing better layers throughout the print is to tell it that they're all top layers which basically tells the printer to go especially slow for all the layers, which then, you know, you could get the same results with other means, but that was his quick trick, you know, just set top layers to a thousand top layers <laughs> and you end up with basically a solid print that was printed nice and slow. So it gets better quality. The, the smaller nozzles don't necessarily benefit the, the outer, surfaces of of a print on you know on the sides as opposed to the top or bottom um the diameter of the nozzle is going to determine the the radius of any corner right you can't have the, the any corner on the model smaller than the radius of the nozzle right so you can't have an actual hard sharp corner it's going to be radius based on the diameter of the nozzle because it'll go here and then it'll go there and you have a little rounded corner so a smaller nozzle will give you sharper edges, but the main reason to use a smaller nozzle is for those top and bottom surfaces. So you can do finer details on the top and bottom surfaces. So you can right. have better lettering and stuff like that. On If you're printing signs, you can have smaller lettering and things like that, or, or just finer detail overall on the on the plane, on the flat plane itself, as opposed to the vertical surfaces. And I also remember you mentioning the orientation of the model as well, because you had asked Paul how he oriented that, that particular print. Yeah, and, and I remember some of the guys would print them pointing up into the sky because then all those surfaces are created by layers rather than having those horizontal surfaces created by these stair step layers. So you don't see the step so much. Yeah, and that actually does make a difference. And I've done several bodies that way and it works quite well. The challenge is that when you take support off the tail, you tend to lose a little bit of the detail on the tail of the car. So if it's a Can-Am car, right, that has a flat rear end, no big deal. That's easy to do. But some of the sports racers that have some real curvature to them or details in the rear panel, you end up losing that if you print them vertically. So you really almost need to print them horizontally to do that. Or similar to a resin printer, give them a slight angle and that changes the the uh, angle of the layer, so it minimizes it a little bit. Here's here's something you you've probably already thought of this, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn this so it's pointing up, and then I'm going to split the model right down the middle and flip the bottom part, and then I could print them like that and then glue them together in the middle. Yeah, but why do I want to glue a car together? I'm just saying that this would make a pretty nice print. <laughs> that's that's one of the, yeah, I mean, if you slice the back three inches off the car or back inch off yeah. to save the panel, that's how Vlad did the first few. Yeah. And, you know, we played with that initially and just went, yeah, that's not the way to do it. <laughs> but but I, I, I imagine, though, if you're doing like a static kit, you could do it that way, right? Well, sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, you didn't. I just, I just did it in the middle because that was convenient. That you know, you can drag the, where it splits anywhere right. you want. And like he was saying, just put it near the back where it's not going to be structural so much. But yeah. with, you, with, you can with do extra... that. But it's you know, then you got to glue everything together and you got to design things in to line it up, tongue and groove, and it all just becomes a pain. It's easier just to print it. <laughs> with the extra printing time up to twenty odd hours, is it is the cover for the printer? to keep the heat in more essential or not as doesn't need it as much it depends on the material you're printing if you print in pla which has a, a fairly low uh, melting temperature you don't want to put it in an enclosure because what you end up with is what's called heat creep and the material if the enclosure is warm enough that the material starts to get closer to its melting point before it goes into the extruder then it gets soft while it's being pushed by the extruder and you end up with jams in the printer. 
So you, so with PLA, you don't want an enclosure. In fact, you want more cooling. You want better airflow. But you know, other other materials, you'd want an enclosure to to prevent warping and splitting and things like that. Like I mentioned before the before the recording. Yeah, don't get hung up. Don't, don't get hung on up the on line. that. As I say, on don't, don't get hung up on that twenty hours of print, you guys. I mean, a lot of the roadsters you can print them they're 10 to 12 hours and that's running at 60 percent exactly so it, it, is, it isn't always 20 at all no most, i mean my, it, most of mine are 12. it depends entirely on on the size of the car right the mercedes was a long one because it's a big car and that one only took me i think 13. and and how much how if much support it, any given model actually needs yeah that was it. That was it. I run a 50% speed always. Slower is it's just better for detail, I think. You know, yeah, mm -hmm. it is. The yeah, files are just files are just so good now. Uh, the sanding almost doesn't have to happen. I mean, I'm looking yeah. at the same Mercedes Paul just showed you, came off a couple of days ago. I'm not even going to sand it, I'm just going to prime it. It's, it's unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just say everything that I showed, I took off the printer, put one coat of future on it, and then painted it. That's it. Yeah. Done. I didn't, so good, no. I did not spend hours and hours sanding those. Not anymore. Does the future help with reducing the, the, the depth of the layer lines by like filling yep. in the cracks a little bit? Yep, exactly. Yes. yes. Well, that makes that makes perfect sense because the future is self leveling. So yeah, it'll fill in those gaps. Exactly. Right. That's a great idea. That's better than the resin nice. thing. <laughs> that that better than that smooth oh. on stuff. It's smooth on cells that stuff you paint on and then it smooths out all the layers. There's just, there's just no gaps anymore. I mean, you look at these and you go, I mean, there's less work to do on this than all the resin bodies are built. You know, once the print is done, resin bod bodies you always had some sanding, some filling, you know, not that, you know, it's all still about the same. Do, do either of you have any handy that you have not removed supports from yet? Yeah, there's one here, I think. And this is an old one, so there's a ton of supports in it. Oh, gee, it. What's that, Steve? That's <laughs> an early, I don't even know, is that the little alpha? Is that the, uh, is that the Healy? Yeah, it is the Healy. Yeah, that's the Healy. If I got a better oh. one. Let's see if I got a no. That's where are you guys getting? Where are you guys getting the files? Are you guys making your own? Thingiverse. We've made a couple. Okay. Vlad does a bunch. You steal them off of uh, games, sim <laughs> racing sites. Some of the guys are really good at CAD, and they're wonderful to have. Simple files. Paul, I can do. Paul's gotten better at it all the time. You know, they come from everywhere now, actually. I mean, I mean the, the Toyota 7 came from a guy that ripped off the, the car from a, a sim racing upgrade pack, right? It, it had, he just took the car out of a sim program and, and made the mesh, and then I cleaned up the body for it. I think I have like 60 slot car files now, which maybe 20 I haven't done yet. Yeah, if you're if you're interested in printing slot car bodies, you want to be on HRW forum. Yep. Um, and, and, you know, get in with these 3D printing guys and they'll hook you up with some files. I, I can tell you that the files take up a lot less space than the molds. <laughs> that's for sure. Yes. That's, yes. That, that's definitely one advantage to the 3D printing is we don't have a wall full of molds for all the cars that we want to make. Yeah, the problem is when you start printing bodies, you can't stop. And now I've got four piles of bodies waiting to be converted into cars. <laughs> I don't know. John told me the same thing about casting. That if I just learn how to do one, it's going to go crazy. Can't stop. Yeah, it, ma it makes heroin addiction look like a craving for something salty. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking, you know, what, what's Jason. the problem with having with having four piles of bodies waiting for chassis? That's the whole. That's the whole point of life. That's exactly, Dennis. That's, I just have to print all my chassis now. So oh, I no, 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 no. <laughs> chassis don't get printed. <laughs> Plastic is for bodies. Brass is for chassis. Yeah. <laughs> Somehow I knew you'd say yeah. that. <laughs>
<laughs> awesome. Anybody else got any questions on that topic before we move on? Go ahead, Russ. Well, I have a question, but it's not on that topic. Okay, yeah, anything. So are there any suggestions or can I get suggestions for the best trackside camera? I could use my iPhone 13, but I'd rather have something that's ded dedicated to my racer. Is it are, are, you are you trying to follow the racing, Russ, or what, 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 what are you intending to, to try and capture? I'd like to be able to follow the cars as they're racing, maybe glance up and get pictures of the club guys, but mostly to film, set the camera in one spot and be able to film the cars going around without getting really digitalized. You know what I mean? They get you, want real the whole you want to do the whole track from a, 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 a Vista viewpoint kind of thing? Or do you want to be down low like you're I'd like, like you're to be able to do either one. I'd like to be able to be up top over the track. And I'd also like to be able to move that to a maybe a corner and get the whole track. You know, if, if you set if you set up with multiple cameras, uh, that might be your best bet. The only thing is you might have to do a wee bit of editing. Or yeah, cameras. And, and money. <laughs> I would get a GoPro. Or you get a GoPro. GoPro? One of the, yeah, I would get a GoPro with the new one. They have a USB adapter that plugs into your computer. You take your laptop out and you hit record from your laptop and it saves all that on your laptop. Then you don't have to worry about uploading it to the GoPro. Now on my GoPro, I got a special adapter that plugs into a USB port, does kind of the same thing, but the GoPro then also has wide angle view and I can pick up my full 16 foot track with one camera then if I want to. Is that the one you're recommending? I've, I've got. Uh, let me look it up, but I would start with GoPro. I have a GoPro seven. I don't recommend that one because it's older. I had to kind of make mine work and I you work know, in I, IT, but I still the got newer a, ones. I, I have a GoPro as well and I still use it. It's a GoPro three, a GoPro yeah. hero three. And it plugs right into the computer with USB and automatically transfers the file out of the GoPro into my computer. And then I can edit them or just upload them straight to YouTube. But I will often, I have like a, you know, when you get a GoPro or, or a similar action camera is, is the category of camera. Uh, a lot of them are designed to be GoPro compatible. So you basically then you, you get a kit of GoPro mounts, right? And one of the mounts that I got in my kit uh, I, I basically uh, glued a bunch of magnets to, and then I like screwed some some T brackets, some very you know st steel T brackets and whatnot in into uh, the various things in my garage, and then I just stick the camera magnetically to that bracket, point it where I think it should be, and then you can use the app on your phone or whatever to see what it's seeing, and then make sure it's pointing exactly where you want it to point. And then hit, you can tell it to record from your phone and it, it records until you tell it to stop. You know, if you look at a bunch of, uh, if you look at my, some, some of my old videos with uh, digital racing and analog racing, you'll see, you know, those wide angle shots showing the entire track from above is, is those are all filmed right. with the GoPro. And, and I've, so, I've even used, I've even used key fob uh, cameras and put them on the cars, which is, yeah, I, I, it's really not fun to watch because it's, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, I'm thinking, see, I want it to be crisp. I don't want them to be fuzzy and stuff. Um, I got a GoPro, but it's an older one, and I have used the Monster. Um, now, there's a new GoPro out, I heard, that's a GoPro Black, maybe, or something like that. Let me see a look at mine. Should I this go with the lighter? I mean, there, Go these days GoPros are like cell phones. There's a new one every year with some new feature, or, yeah. or whatever. So, you know, just go to what, go to your favorite store, get the latest GoPro. It'll probably do everything you want it to. Well, I got That's the so GoPro Seven, but I had to buy a special adapter to make it work with my laptop. So, I, if you go with the GoPro Eight or newer, then they have software that you can just you can use it like a webcam, it, but it's okay. a high definition webcam. So that's why I liked it. And then I'm going to, this spring, I'm going to start filming some of our events, but I just haven't got around to it. But so yeah, look for a GoPro thing, 8 or newer. That's, that's one of the things that I can't do with my older Hero 3 is use it direct as a camera with my computer. It just does not serve as a camera for my computer. Does it, it have an HDMI out? 
No, it's just got USB. Oh, okay. You know, it 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 has USB and it has a yeah. you know, it's got some other plug that I never use, but it basically is re is record to memory card, and then I can either pull the memory card out or yeah. connect the camera itself to the computer via USB and transfer the files that way. Yeah, people so, wanted that ability to use it as a webcam. So I think eight or yeah. newer, you can use it as a webcam. Yeah, I got a generic uh, version of, of a mono price that was just a fraction of the cost of a GoPro. Um, and it was a, quite a while ago, and I, I know they have some upgraded ones. I think I got mine like five years ago. What was it called? Monoprice, monoprice.com. This is a website that has a lot of uh, generic stuff. Um, uh, so what's the quality just, like? Great. I actually just, ironically, I just did a little run this, this week on mine, on my track. Is that what you put on your car? Is that what you put on your car to get that track footage? Uh, no, the, what, the, not, not what you see here. I just did it. I haven't, I haven't shown you guys. I, I thought about it. But I said, ah, it's too boring. <laughs> well, you uploaded something to your YouTube channel not too long ago. It was, if it was this week, then that's what it was. Yeah, that's what I was saying. You, so that, the, so the, the camera you put on the car to go around the track that you put on your yes. YouTube, that's yes. what you, that's what you yes. use. Okay. Okay. I don't think anybody looked at my YouTube channel. <laughs> I'm subscribed to you, man. I, I watch your videos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, so to, to your point, Dewan, like th these things which are sort of um, GoPro like, and this is actually Bluetooth, it's actually wireless. I, I use these around the track to, if I'm yeah. doing a, you know, a, sort of an illustration of yeah, a car going around my track. And the good thing is, these were like $20 Canadian, which is what, like three cents US? Um, <laughs> What's yeah, that so one? It's, it's basically yeah, so, it's a cheap so, brand GoPro. So what's the model? What's the brand? Oh, the, the, the they're, they're probably under it. This one's called ExoCam. <laughs> All brand you can trust, let me tell you folks. But the great thing is at that price, you can grab like yeah, a bunch three of them, them, right? I mean, I'm not going to do three camera Monty or anything for you folks, but that's, you put them everywhere, hit record, and then sync it up uh, for editing. Or is well, they only need two hard. cameras to do 3D. <laughs> <laughs> or Just they push the record button at the exact or... same time. <laughs> you know, would you guys go with the 1080p? Yeah. Or... Oh, yeah. You know, 4K, your, your eye cannot really see 4K. That's the marketing guys trying to convince you to buy something you don't need. <laughs> 4K okay. lets you zoom in and still get the good quality, though. If you, if you have a 4K yeah. sensor... I mean, if, Again, if, if you're doing a lot of pan and scan in your edits, absolutely 4K. But 1080, you can still get away with quite a bit. But, um, you'll be fine at 1080. Especially yeah. if people, uh, most people watch stuff through their phones anyway. Yeah. And yeah, and YouTube don't, don't like 4K. YouTube yeah, I don't upload anything to YouTube in, in that high no. definition. No, no. 10, 1080 is just fine. Yeah. Just fine. Okay. But that's I, the I final that's that. the final upload, not not the source. I mean, having a good having a good CCD, your 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 sensor gives you those about options for zooming in and still having the good quality. Oh yeah, well my about my this main... summer we do a video cam web challenge. We all film <laughs> something and we see what works best because I think the 4K <laughs> does works. upload better. Yeah, well, well my, you know, like my main what John is saying is basically this... the, the cheap stuff has gotten it's better. Been, the technology has been around long enough for the cheap stuff to be good enough to be worth buying. Right. Now, now, what I use for my main stuff is this, like Sony XHDR, Ooh. basically broadcast. And I do those for, a, you know, I do a two camera shoot for stuff that I do around the garage. But on the track, I just put those things around, hit record, and do a little bit of editing. Yeah. And if, if you're, um, if you're what, viewing what your stuff, Juan, what? I'm looking at uh, D1. Oh, hold on. Let me. Yeah, this is the like, system. This is my seven-year-old model price uh, generic uh, device that I just mounted on my uh, one of my flat cars. And it's pretty light. It's it's not as you know. And again, this is a seven-year-old model. I don't know what they have right now. I haven't looked. Yeah, probably couldn't even buy that if you wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm sure they've updated them. <laughs> it runs on DOS. Car, it's your slow car a bulldozer. Yeah. Are you Jim, you were trying to say something earlier. What were you trying to say? Yeah, yeah. If if you're viewing it on a cell phone or on an iPad, it doesn't make much difference whether you're in 4K. But on a 4K monitor, it can make a huge difference. Um, and the, the the big question is, you know, I come from the camera industry. So, Russell, what do you want to use these videos for? What 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 is your output? You want to put them on YouTube, just a webcam 
that determines YouTube, which five. YouTube, um, face, I've got a Facebook page. I've got a YouTube site. Um, I'd like to put them on there. Um, if I want to email somebody a short video clip, I'd like to be yeah, able the, to. Okay. The problem, and I don't disagree with what anybody said, the GoPros are cool little cameras. The problem with GoPros is because they have, uh, you know, cameras have different sensor sizes. And the sensor size doesn't determine the megapixels, but it does determine how the camera functions in low light. And most lock cars are in, most lock car tracks are indoors. The stuff you see outside on a GoPro looks spectacular. But when you come in in low light, it starts to fall down. And then you Correct. may or may not, it may be good enough for you. Uh, but you can go to a better camera that has a larger sensor and Correct. does much better in low light. That, I, I went with a Sony camera working for Canon for 38 years. It was tough for me to buy a Sony. But the camera that I bought is a great vlogging camera. Now, the opposite side to that, without going into a huge dissertation about how cameras work the bigger sensors also have shallower depth of field so there's less in focus which is good for cinem cinematic types of things mm -hmm. but it's probably not good for what we kind of documentary ish type of what we're doing here mm -hmm. so there you know we could talk about this for four or five hours and what's the best <laughs> for you but uh there's all kinds of issues involved in this so I just posted a link in the chat to a, a video I saw this week off Boone's Slot Car Garage Facebook group. Um, this is it, this is the best best GoPro job I've seen. Now this is mounted on a car, so take a look at it if you if uh, you so wish. I think but, it's got uh, GoPro it's pretty stabilization slick. turned on. That's why yeah, it looks stabilized. Sick. I mean, yeah, that's nice. And when, turn the volume on you can actually hear the wind rushing through too it's crazy i might yeah. i might just i'd love to have it to be able to have something like that and to see that somebody's actually been able to pull it off finally without a bunch of blue you know like blue the jumpiness the weird turns yeah and, and, you know do, do you know what kind of camera it was it was a gopro uh i i went i i don't know the i don't recall the model i i GoPro followed, hero eight, GoPro GoPro said, hero eight. yeah yeah yeah, but so, it's just what Jim like, said. It's all about light and lightning. Oh yeah, always. And I, I, I bought a the, GoPro, and I would, that, and this is me video. personally because I've the, the background I have. I bought a GoPro to use for RC cars and for slot cars, yeah. and I was not satisfied with the quality. Other people are getting great results for it, so I went with a higher end camera. So that's just me. Uh, but there are reasons why you may or may not want to go to a to a higher end camera most likely the GoPro is going to work fine for you. I, the, 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 good, the good news is, Russell, it's, it's not what you use. It's what you capture. If you capture some great stuff, it doesn't matter what you use, man. People will watch it. That's the most important thing is the, the, the you know, the content. Right. Right. Movement, at this point, for, for what you want to do, you'll probably be fine with some, some, you know, GoPro clones like John was showing, you know, as long right. as they have, you know, 1080p or more for their, you know, video quality, you're, you'll be fine. And, and uh, that video that uh, Bill shared the link to, absolutely go see it. it. I agree with him. It's some of the best in-car footage I've ever seen. Yeah, that's, I just looked at it. That's Amazing. a testament not only to the quality of the camera and its stabilization function, but the quality of the car and the track that it's on, because obviously that car is smooth. Oh yeah, somebody spent quiet. the time on that. Like mm -hmm. that car is like you. You would not be hearing the wind if the car itself was not just practically silent. I, I think that's the stabilization mode because after GoPro Seven, they added stabilized cam for bikes and stuff. Like on my motorcycle, I get smooth like this now too. Instead of my old cheap camera was always like. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, so, but, I, the, but the reason I know that the car is smooth is because of how yeah. quiet it is. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but also filming filming is an art. Uh, I spent about seven, eight days making a Le Mans movie uh, for about uh, a clip of four or five minutes. So it's a lot of work. So Dave Kennedy had a he had a video just a couple maybe a month or so ago I think and he he was trying he's been trying to get a GoPro strapped onto one of those chassis and mm -hmm. I he got it he's getting closer I he has one Dunlop sign that keeps giving him trouble on one corner but 
but that's but that's kind of the thing and it's nowhere near the same speed as that that video i mean it's just that's crazy are those foam it's, tires too i have I mean, no that's idea gonna absorb a lot of the vibration well, yeah, that car that. would have had that, uh, whatever chassis they were using, there would have been 124 scale for the starter. And it's on the wood track and it would have had foam tires. Yeah, it's a commercial yeah. car on a commercial track with, with foam tires. What or camera, someone could have done some sound editing, folks. Let's be realistic here. What kind of camera was that? GoPro 808. Oh, yeah. I just posted my. Uh... Seven-year-old camera footage, uh, minute, but minute and a half footage. <laughs> yeah, so you guys can take a look at that one. Hey, no, sure. it's 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 what you shoot, not what you shoot with. Just ask Abe Zabruder, man. I just I just, I just uh, double double tape stuck that on a, on a slotted uh, chaparral and went around the track about five laps. So, so did you did you did you double stick tape it to the actual body of the car or the I chassis? Did. <laughs> Yeah, so I think that's what most of us do when we first do it, and of course that makes the car just incredibly top heavy, and you can't, yes. you cannot drive the car. Yeah. So the, the problem with if you put the if you put the the camera mm -hmm. on the take the body off, and if you've yes, got room on the chassis, stick it straight to the chassis. The problem with that is that you have you have car tires right there, <laughs> and you can see the axle or the the guide flag and stuff yeah. like that too. That's why you go to Thingiverse and download the the camera chassis it's a GoPro design, in front. designed for the gopro and you print the camera chassis and just run it that way yeah or That's or as greg thing. showed use it use a key fob camera and pretend it's 1982 what's the matter with that yeah that works too some of those are good take, take the fvp or the fpv camera off your drone strap it on and away you go yep. let me ask a question a lot of times when you watch these videos it, it feels unnatural because it's just like a sudden turn what if somebody on the guide pin had a gear ratio so when the guide pin turned the camera also tilted a little before that before entering the turn yeah that actually you you want the camera not to turn as much because the more that the camera jerks the the, the more i'm just I, thinking when i drive i always kind of look into my turn so i'm wondering if the camera turned first as you were making that turn it would be a little oh, more I see your brain yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that because my work. brain gets off when it's just like wham 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 <laughs> oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah it, exactly no yeah it's it, the same thing happens with that's why gopros to, to uh, uh jim's earlier point that's why gopros work really well on race cars because first of all they got a, this wide panoramic view there's tons of light and it's it's a smooth transition even if you're on a, on a tight circuit i mean let, let's remember how how really how fast those things are moving and how sh short the track is yeah, sometimes yeah, I mean, do if you if you shoot it at 60 frames per second and play it back at 30 it's moderate slow motion but it actually looks more natural because those cars are so fast and for and for slot cars you pretty much have to go super slow you can't drive at slot even you can't drive at the speed that you could drive with the gopro on the car you still have to slow down even more than that to get watchable footage on most especially small slot car tracks like most of us have you know that the one in that video the big commercial track they were still going <laughs> very slow but at least it was a big enough track that you could go relatively fast and enjoy the ride whereas they were going real slow you could see them breaking breaking yeah. for the banking yeah right and nobody ever breaks for a banking on a track like that i had a teammate that did once uh. Yeah, but that's just because that was because he was trying to break check you into the bank. Okay. No, he was my teammate. Oh, okay. So he's trying to break check somebody else into the bank. We we told him you could punch the banking and he didn't believe us. No. <laughs> All right. Before we run out of time, Luff, did you have something quick to add to the conversation? Yeah, we we experimented with a whole bunch of different cameras mounted on cars. We ended up with one that was uh, a cordless and it ran on eight double a batteries so it was a big hunk lump thing that we, we built a plexiglass mount to put it on a, a fly truck chassis uh -huh. it was the only thing that could do a lap carrying this big lump so we figured hey it's a 12 volt cordless camera why don't we take it apart and mount the camera on the guide flag and run right off the the track off the the copper mm -hmm. yeah. and we we got it we got it rigged up like that but it, it only worked when you were flat out to get the 12 volts 
Yep. <laughs> lots of things out there. Lots of people doing funny things. Oh, yeah, uh, fun. But before we run out of time, uh, let's. Does anybody have any club corner things they want to talk about? Past, present, or future club racing or home racing with multiple people or groups or whatever? Usually one or two people want to talk about club related things, but I guess not this week. Wayne, yeah, Wayne fell actually. asleep. <laughs> Russ, you waved your hand. Yeah, I would just like to say if anyone is out in the Seattle, area, Tacoma, Puyallup, Graham. If you guys give me a call, if you're going to be out here and you want to take a spin on the track or come to a club race, man, uh, please let us know. Me and Greg race at the same club, and uh, we'd like to have newcomers or visitors, so be great. Yeah, well said. Calm down. Definitely. Yeah, Anybody so vacation if you're traveling for work in the area, let us know and we'll we'll get you hooked yeah. up with some slot car time. Has, yeah. has the uh, 24 hour been announced yet? I or have not heard of it yet. Dennis was saying, raising his hand too. Go ahead, Dennis. Uh, for those who are in Southern California, there's a far out slot car club uh, race at Electric Dreams this weekend. Yeah. Okay. Um, so some of the guys would no doubt want to be there. Uh, if, uh, if you've ever raced at the Electric Dreams before, just remember that the Far Right Club's rules are very different to the Electric Dreams rule. Unfortunately, we now have these two big, these, one group racing in more than one place under different sets of rules. But um, <laughs> yeah, that, that's, slot, that's slot car racing, right? It's always been like that. Uh -huh. Yep. Uh, check, anyway, so posting and running and, and double check the rules before you bring yeah. a car there. So Saturday, Saturday is far out racing, uh, Group C, slotted Group Cs, and NSRF Formula Ones. That's correct. Yes, I'll be there. Yeah, uh, so, I mean I will be too. I, oh, great! See, yeah, give, give Eddie Shore a bit of a run for his money for a <laughs> All right, have fun with that. Yeah. Of, I'm, I'm doing Jim. I'll do Jim Rose's job this weekend and try and beat Eddie. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, All boy. right. Thank you very much. Uh, to the GT Russ, race. Russ, we're going to find yeah. uh, their, their calendar of uh, activities and events because I, I do kind of have some uh, flexible travel privileges. <laughs> Come on, man. I'm serious. Come on. Get, get some messaging going on between you guys and, and I'm yeah. sure you can work it out. Uh, Jeremy has his hand up. What's going on uh, club wise for you, Jeremy? Hey, sorry, this isn't really club wise. Well, it is because this is my club car. Um, Fly Classics, I need a silicone tire. And I know uh, Super Tires makes a silicone tire, but it's got a really high profile. Does anybody know a lower tire that would fit on a Fly Classic that's a silicone? Like, I found one in my box, but unfortunately, I only found one. So right. I, I, didn't so, I hate when that happens. So, Jeremy, it, silicone or urethane? No, I have to be silicone because everybody oh. in the club already runs silicone. So if I don't keep up, I'm going to be behind. Because yeah, I, I make your I have urethanes for the fly classics, you know, the, the low yeah. profile firestone, the wide ones. The original, yeah. the original um silicon tire for that was the Indie Group uh, 3003. Uh you won't find those anymore, but I think the Max Track uh, M04X is the same tire. Or pretty much the same. Is and it Max Tracks what? Uh, M04X. M04X. M zero four X. M M for okay. M zero four X. I seem to remember. Okay. Uh, and then there's probably a quick six one as well, but I don't remember the number of that. I can, I'll I find it for you before we're done. Well, I found this old super tire that does fit perfectly, but I can't figure out what the super tire super tire was. Like, should I measure like the dimensions of it or that? Oh, uh, they they have their own they have their own numbers for them, and the, the guy who used to make super tires has passed on. So there are not very many super tires available right now. Oh. Uh, in fact, there is a number of um, of the super tires, uh, silicon tires that are just plain out of stock now. Two one one two is the tire you want for the Fly Classics. Two one one two one. Two one one two. Twenty one twelve. Okay. 
Hey, that isn't that a Rush album? Right. What brand? What? I was going to say, that's a great that's album. The... Yeah, for right on. That's yeah. the... Exactly. That's the super tire. Super tire. Super tire. Okay. All right. Anything else, Jeremy? No, thank you, guys. Perfect. All right, Mike, go ahead. Um. Yeah, I am. Um, we we had a test into him. One of the guys didn't show up this week because uh, he had to work, and I had an interesting phenomenon happen. First off, I was teaching the, uh, one of the guys to set his car up. Magnus, we were setting up a couple of our scale electric, and and uh, and he decided to set up one of the slotted can ams for magless racing and i told him what he should do and we measured the front rear ratios and and put in the weights like this and right off the bat the car was as fast as any of my thunder slots and i went wow i'm really good well then i tried on my uh slot at alpha and it was dismal i was like a full second off the pace and i tried everything i could think of weight wise and 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 trying to get it to work and it would not work no matter what I did until I slept on a set of foam tires and then it got right down to seven sevens just right off the bat it was just so weird the foam tires have not worked on any other car but it was sort of like a Hail Mary and it was like holy cow a full second with just a set of tires who, who knew well, good, so, to anyway. good to hear that those tires aren't just headed for the garbage bin <laughs> Well, I have enough sets of them. <laughs> uh, Dewan had a fantastic question that he that he sent me a message on. Dewan, do you want to go ahead and ask it? Oh. I think it's a great um, topic for discussion for the last 20 minutes. Yeah, I, uh, as you guys know, I'm not a very good driver. Um, so I was wondering if... Uh, there are people out there that are willing to share some of their tips and tricks of becoming a good driver. And um, so that was the first thing and giving some um, tips on techniques. Because some people that saw me drive and they said, well, you should be uh, standing this way. You should use both hands instead of one hand and your fatigue is going to, you know, they're going all kind of things, which was great. I kind of sucked it in, but I just kind of want to hear from the group from that aspect. So that was the first question. And all by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> the second question was uh when you're going to a new track how do you go and scope out um the tactics for figuring out that track and do you like set up little um uh cue points uh, along the track to as breaking points and things like that i'm just kind of curious about how people go about uh, becoming as good as they are um uh, uh, and the, the key thing was that showed the difference was that uh, Eddie Shore had the same exact car that I had in the Far Out Racing Club, and he finished 42 laps ahead of me. So it's the driver. <laughs> you are. Right. So, very good question, man, because I'm also a shitty driver. So, yeah, if someone is going to answer, then it's going to be a good one, especially when I'm traveling, traveling overseas. Thank you for asking. Anybody want to take that? I, uh, for me, I would tell you what helps me out is to just race myself. Don't race with anybody else. Race yourself, focus on your car, and just that's the best way to slowly get up to speed. And then eventually you'll be right there with the guys. But driving, I think, by yourself, you know, or focused on yourself and not the other cars, probably the best. But we do all have bad days anyway. So that's for sure. we're not perfect for sure. I'll, I'll throw a couple of tips out. Uh, what, what, what I often suggest to new drivers that, that come and, and race at the club is, um, like uh, Paul said in, in the text chat, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Uh, and Alan Smith often says, it's easier to teach a consistent driver to get faster than it is a fast driver to be consistent. So what you want to do is basically focus on just take the take the track slowly, right? Go slow around the like crawl around the turns. And when your car gets to the straight and it's straight on the straightaway, punch it and let go, right? You want to give it full gas and let go right away because you're seeing how quickly it gets up to speed 
and how quickly, how, how long it takes to, to break, to get you know, down to a slow speed. And then do the same thing around the track multiple times. And each time you go around a turn slowly, go around it less slowly, right? I'm not saying fast, I'm saying less slowly. And each time you get to a straight, let go of the trigger a little bit later to where you think the car isn't gonna come to a dead stop three feet away from the turn, right? So you're basically just practicing full throttle, let go, full throttle, let go. And then when your car gets to the next turn, a little bit of throttle, so it goes slowly around the turn. And you're just doing that over and over and over and over because eventually you're gonna get better at nailing, the, when your car is on the straightaway, you nail it and then braking at the right time so that it's not going into the turn too quickly, right? It, it's better to come to a dead stop in front of the turn and then crawl around it than to go flying into the turn and tail wagging all the way around the turn. Right, so that's what Paul was saying. Slow is, you know, smooth is slow is smooth, and smooth is fast. If you're going slow and smooth, you'll actually do better times than what looks like fast, where you're tail wagging all over the place. So if you're concentrate on keeping the tail, keeping the car in line, not tail wagging around the turns, nailing your acceleration points on the straightaways, not breaking too late into the turns, and going around the turns at a speed that keeps the car under control. Just do that over and over. And, and the, your follow-up question of how do you learn a new track, that's how I learn a new track. I, if I'm at a new track, I basically go slowly around the track, practicing acceleration and braking points, practicing different speeds around the turns until I can string all of those acceleration and braking points together consistently around the whole track. And it's a lot like one-to-one -one racing. Uh, things are won and lost in, in the turns. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's yep. it's totally in the turn, right? It's all about developing muscle memory for the the breaking points on the track. And Steve Henderson's track is very scenic. He doesn't have runoff aprons on any of the edges. So you have to be able to drive the corners. And uh it's very easy to actually see your car lose a foot on the track by sliding the rear end out when the guy next to you doesn't. So if, when you have to learn how to drive smoothly, you start to understand that it does make a foot or two difference. And you add that up over every corner and all of a sudden you are 10 laps down. And that's all it takes. Yeah, so Paul, you're, absolutely, you're absolutely right. Because in a real car, if you're sliding, you're slow. Another great, to see the back another, great, the another great thing to do is set up a ghost car. Have the ghost car out there and have you react as smoothly and as quickly as you can to that ghost car, knowing that you know you can catch it on the straightaway, but you fall you fall back in the curves. Well, learn to catch it in the curves, but Correct. You know, under control. But a ghost car is a great way to do that. Yeah, what everybody said, every time, you, every time you visibly see the back end come out just a little bit, every time you see it, that's a tenth of a second. Yeah, and, and the rule of thumb with curves is like my dates in high school, slow in, fast out. Another thing, um, when you're 40, and you got to answer this honestly, Duan, in that race when you're 42 laps down, how many times did Eddie come off? That's true. Well, see, that was a key thing. I, no, I'm serious. How many no, times no, did he no, come bro, off? I don't think he ever came. He may have came off once. How many times did you come off? Uh, a dozen. Okay, there, there's... Six, there, it was six lanes. You know, we were, we were across... It was an electric grid, so it was six lanes. Yeah. So, yeah, but you, but you may try, and this works for some people, doesn't work for everybody, is turn your brakes down. When you turn your brakes down, the car will get a whole lot smoother. You're going to have to brake earlier, but it'll just roll around the corners and you can pick the throttle up and the car is less loose and then practice that until you can do that 10 or 15 laps without it in a row without coming off and then turn the brakes up a little bit and you, just out, uh, you have to use their controllers you don't have brakes uh, unfortunately far out they, they, they have the, the generic uh, professor motor controls with no brakes 
then you're in trouble. Uh, they have brakes. They just don't have any brake adjustment. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. No, yes, <laughs> they have brakes. <laughs> I mean, okay. Well, if you can't do that, you can't do that. Can you unhook them? No, that's uh, that's part of the, the club rules. They they just use it generic. It is it's uh, as as uh, Dennis has alluded to. They have some very strict. Uh, um, well, I, I think that's a very poor rule, but I don't want to get in, get into that. Yeah, well, yeah. It, it handicaps can, some can people and others. <laughs> but you, you just yeah, can't you come know, off. It, it, and even but, if you can't adjust the brakes, then brake early, right? Don't don't try to go deep until you're confident in in the speed you're going to end up at. You know, get, break early, and then go slow around the turn. Keep keeping it in line. You know, the only thing that worries me sometimes about Fine, break guys. early. The thing that worries me sometimes about break early is that if you don't have a sensitivity adjustment and you break early, the very first thing that you do is as you get back on the throttle is you push the nose up in the beginning of the corner. Yeah. So there are times where it's better to do what you were saying earlier is to start working out your braking points first so that you can go down the straightaway, find a braking point, go down the straightaway, flat out, find a braking point, let go and see where the car stops. If the car stops before the corner, then you still are braking too early. You want to be at a point where the car basically stops just about at the point where you would normally naturally want to pick up the throttle right and that'll help you get the braking points if you can turn your brakes down it's always a good thing to do if you can't well then you just got to learn to to do it this way the other thing when you're at a new track stand behind the guy the, the fast guy while he's driving and hold your own controller unplugged and try to drive his car with your controller right so use the sense, use your vision to see what his car is doing and try to match your finger to what the car is doing. And eventually, if you get to the point of understanding, of getting to, to, to feel that there's, a, that there's a, a correlation between what your finger is doing and what you see the car doing, now you start to understand where he's braking, where he is accelerating, how much. It's actually, it's difficult to do. But if you can get it right, you you learn a lot very quickly. Good tip. But you just, yeah, you for just, me, you just I can't come out. out. I mean, that's yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, just don't come out. <laughs> but I mean, there's, 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 yeah, there's driving and there's racecraft. And racecraft says you don't come out. Yeah. So <laughs> we've gotten better at that. that was, my first race, I came out probably a dozen times. My second second uh, or third race, I think I probably came out maybe four times or so, so well, the, I, I, the, I, the race two weeks ago the can-am race down there the top three the top three finishers came out a total of four times among all of them yes i saw that <laughs> that's the biggest clue and that's yeah. and if you can go fast and do that then that's better but if you can go slow and do that you're still going to come out better off than most people yeah what were you saying so do you have a time do you have a time for practicing before do yes. i Yes. Yeah, so I think, you know, when I started racing analog on wooden track, I mean, the main things that changed the, the equation was practicing after the racing was over. So we usually stayed one hour, two hours after the racing. And basically, I was putting the laps down as crazy until basically you get to the kind of, you know, the muscle memory. Because... You know, you cannot really explain or no stop, or go quicker and change and do whatever. So it's just basically getting used to the to the muscle memory. And then, of course, I mean, controller is a is a big thing. So if you cannot really yeah. play with the controller settings, then it's going to be more difficult because you have to get used to that specific controller. And then the car as well. I use set up of the car. I mean, for me, one of the things that really changed a lot was uh, pre preparing the tires. So that one basically changed, like, you know, was 90% uh, of improvement overnight almost when uh, I started kind of learning how to prepare tires. So my cars were much more stable around the corners. I could push hard and much more, for, you know, uh, forgiven without, you know, because always you can get a bit tired also when you're, when, when you're racing after a while, right? So, and that's when you have a good setup car, then, you know, you, you can make a mistake and, and, and still the car can save can save your ass at the end of the day but then there are you know the freaks that basically you know they can keep going for hours without 
you know, it seems like they never get tired and that's, you know, I'm not at that level. And I think John Underwood should talk because John Underwood is a guy that travels all across the UK and Europe and, and racing in all kinds of sorts of tracks. And he's always coming up with a good result. So I would love to hear what he say. And what practice on time? all lanes. At a commercial I mean, yeah, track. we race a digital, but yeah, yeah, that's also true. Yeah. All right, go ahead, John. Very simple. Practice, <laughs> practice, practice. Correct. And when you've done some practice, do a lot more. And that's all I've done. Making hours. Yeah. And on, you know, and on um, different tracks. All yeah. lanes, even the yeah. gutter lanes. When you go to a new club, just practice the two outer lanes. Um, you can't always get them, but you know you have to race the middle ones, which is fair enough. You need to learn them as well. But if you can, um, if you go to a multi lane, four, five, six lanes, eight lanes, whatever, try the inner and outer lanes because they're always, always the hardest. Got the sharper bends and also got the big sweeper bends. Um, but go to other clubs. Speak to the quick guys, see what they're doing. Say, oh, the car's not quite, can you have a look at it for us? And most people, um, especially in the UK, um, who do bits and bobs, um, you know, help give you a set of tires, change your gear. Um, but the main thing is practice and go to different clubs. Um, that's all I've ever done and do a lot of it. <laughs> and another thing too, uh, Duan, is especially at if you're at Far Out, have Eddie drive your car. Yeah. And if he'll let you drive his car, that too. Yeah, right. But if you're 40 laps down, it's I can't imagine it's all you. No, well, and again, the, the far out the, the the amount of changes you can do. Only thing you can do is just change the back tires and true them. And it's everything else is exactly a, the same. E even with far out rules, there's a ton you can do to make the car better. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but if your car's not good, and that's why I say have Eddie drive yeah, your car, yes, or right. if he'll let you drive his car, see how much better yeah. his is than yours. Yeah. And then so that's that's that part of it. Up. You know, if you're struggling, so if Jack Eddie or you know, Jim, if Jim's there, or Dennis is off without the weekend. Yeah. 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 Dennis, just have a quick look at the car because it might be something fundamentally you don't see. Dennis looked at it, oh yeah, da, da, da. um we did a race, one of the digital races, one of um our other teammates were struggling um, and sort of looked at the car and I said, I'll probably drop the guide a little bit more. Simple little things, you know. Um, I remember Alan was mentioning the other week, um, we got the uh, motion uh, in the SR F1s this weekend down at, uh, in London. It's a um, big six lane um, motion track, as you would know, um, and it's like recess. So I spent sort of half an hour, I've got three chassis for it. Um, so I spent sort of half an hour just setting the ride heights. So the setup got the wheels are just off, so I know the guy's just going to be recessed enough just to, you know, simple little things like that, which gain you tenths of a second. We've got to be consistent. Um, but as I said, as I said you just got to go around, you just keep going around the track. You'll soon find out where you're coming out on the corner. So break a little bit earlier. Yeah. Um, another guy would go around the same corner and he'd, he'd come out a bit faster. Think, oh, oh, maybe I can get on the car a little bit earlier. There's always someone there to put it back in and look at another few goes, don't you? So practice, practice, practice. That's that's all I say to people. Um, each club's different. Wood, plastic. Um, see the quick guy, see the guy who runs it normally, he's normally one of the quicker ones, or he'll point you in the direction. Um, you know, oh. I don't think the car's quite in. Go and have a look at it, and then help you out. Go and have a look at the you know, throttle settings. If you can adjust your throttle, then great. Um, I race um, plastic, I race a link car. I just use a 25 ohm controller. And that's it. I don't need an adjustable controller. Um, I need some wood. I use adjustable controller. Um, same thing, I tend to sort of back the sensitivity off as, as you know, upgrade to control it. A basic hundred buck. Control is ideal. Round tires, if it moves a little bit, you know. <laughs> clean brakes, that's another thing. Um, just make sure your brakes are clean and it takes two minutes to change them over. All right, I'm sorry to interrupt here and we're, we'll, we'll probably talk about this more after the end of the recording in, in a few minutes here. 
Before I cut all discussion off, uh, Iceman, you raised your hand for this. Do you want to toss something in at the last minute here? Yeah, just a couple of things. Um, yeah, years ago, yeah, John's right, just practice, practice. And, you know, I had my own tracks. So I was fortunate. I remember being down in the garage in the winter, but I had my pajamas on. I'm practicing for kind of a few hours. I had the die slot on and I maybe try to <clears throat> listen to that beep if you've made a, a better lap. And then I think, yeah, that was pretty smooth. I was trying not to go so fast that I was out of control, but yeah, and practice like John was saying also all the lanes and yeah, I, I think we'd all agree that the, the two outer lanes are usually tougher. So if you can drive them fairly well, the middle lane should be, um, you know, not easier, but they should be more comfortable to drive in. So, yeah. And uh, I, I don't know if this is, we talked about it earlier about the Kelvin light that the Dale had, um, had one. Um, if I could try to share, is it okay to do that? A picture of it, or yeah, go ahead. Uh, I've never done this before, Greg. So I've got it up, and um, oh, there it is. Yep. Is it up? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was. Um, as you can see, it was one thirty second, maybe a little bit bigger. Um, and it didn't last very long. They were, they didn't work very well. And, you know, Dale and I would look at that thing and, um, yeah, Kelvin light was made in Spain. You know, Dale had the robo clean cause, and I, I still have the Kelvin light test bench and the robo clean, if I recall was either 200 or $300. I can't recall what Dale paid for, but it was expensive. And then the test bench was 500 and this goes back uh, about 1998 so yeah kelvin light was expensive stuff it seemed to be well made but yeah the robo clean didn't last too long because it didn't do a very good job that's it, it has, on that it has battery power as well as track power hasn't it yes yes right yeah. so if and the rails can, are really dirty it can keep going yeah, and then yeah. switch back to track power when the rails right, are clean right yeah so it was a long time that I haven't seen that in a long time, but anyway, I'm finished sharing. So, all right. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks yeah, you're welcome. It. And before I hit the stop button, uh, you've made it to the end of the video, so now you're going to be rewarded by finding out how to enter the contest for the magnetic racing building kits that we will draw next week. Does anybody have any ideas for what uh, what somebody should say, John? Laser. We talked laser. about lasers, and they're created by lasers. There we go, freaking lasers. All right, so put a comment in the YouTube comments, not Facebook, not forum. Go to the YouTube video, put YouTube comment in YouTube, 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 YouTube. Comment anything that includes the word laser, and we're gonna make you spell it correctly, L-A-S-E-R. I won't make you capitalize it, but uh, <laughs> technically it's an acronym. Uh, but yes, use the word laser in your comment and you will be entered to win one of the magne magnetic racing kits. Uh, we'll do, we'll, what, just for future reference, and you guys can help me remember next week, we're going to do the, the top three after I randomize the, the uh, entries. Top three are going to be the winners. And we're going to go uh, grandstand, Marshall Hut, grandstand. It'll be a little, sa a little grandstand, a little Marshall Hut sandwich there of what people win. You can enter both contests. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, if you have a Area 3 or Professor Motor tire true, not a tire razor, uh, send me a picture of your tire true to gaub at gaub.com and you will be entered to win the tire true sanding plate reciprocation machine. Uh, you can enter both contests, but you can only win one contest. So if you win a magnetic racing building, you're not going to win the reciprocator and vice versa. Uh, but that's unlikely to happen. So <laughs> feel free to enter both contests uh, and, and we'll draw the names next week at some point during next week's chat. For now, we'll wave goodbye. Everybody wave. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.